Today we have a visiting scholar from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Professor Daniel uh, Kostriner. Uh, Professor Daniel Kostriner received his bachelor's and master's in 2011 uh, and the PhD uh, in 2013 from University of Colorado, Boulder. And since 2013, he has been working as an assistant professor in the department of ECE in University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And he has also worked as an instructor in University of uh, Utah State University in 2012. His research in, uh, areas include resonant and soft switching power converter design, high efficiency, wired and wireless power supplies, on-chip power con conversion, medical devices, and electrical vehicles. Dr. Kostriner is also the co-director of education and diversity for the NSF and DOE funded research center in ultra-wide area resilient electrical energy transmission network. He also holds a joint faculty position with Power Electronics and Machines Lab at Oak Ridge National Lab. He serves as the associate editor of the IEEE Journal of Emerging and Selected Topics in Power Electronics and IEEE Transaction of Power Electronics. Please welcome Dr. Kostrina. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody for attending. I'm excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the ongoing research projects we have at the University of Tennessee. Um, is that gonna work? Probably should have checked that beforehand. Make sure, yeah. Okay, um, so before I jump in, just a little bit about where I come from. Uh, the University of Tennessee Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, we are significantly smaller department compared to you guys here at UIUC. We've got 47 faculty and about 250 total grad students. Um, a couple of things that I'll highlight as they relate to power electronics in my research are Current, which is an NSF and DOE sponsored engineering research center in its seventh year now that focuses on power electronics and power systems for the transmission network um, and enabling future technologies for a more robust grid with high penetration of renewable energy. Um, Another um, program we have in the department is called Potential, which is a wide band gap power electronics traineeship funded by DOE. Um, this funds US citizens for graduate studies, focusing on power electronics with specific emphasis on gaining fluency with wide band gap semiconductors. Um, and has a very nice uh, $30,000 per year stipend associated with that. Um, called Potential. Website here is also, I'll mention a little bit later, um, where we list a lot of the research projects that we do in power electronics, if you want any more information on those. And then Oak Ridge National Laboratory is located um, Oak Ridge, which is right next to Knoxville, um, where we work very closely with the Advanced Power Electronics and Electric Machines Group. I actually have a joint appointment there and spend one day a week out at Oak Ridge National Lab. So that's not how you spell current or potential. We kind of have a theme going here. We're working on a way to misspell power, but that's future research at the moment. <laughs> hmm? We, you know, we use the European term here, potential, right? Um, <laughs> so the the important thing is, you know, if we spelled it right, when you Google it, you'd never find us, right? But if you spell it wrong, Google will autocorrect it, and you'll still never find us. Um, <laughs> We have to, as soon as I showed up, I had to go into Microsoft Word and put these in my dictionary so it would stop auto-correcting all of my writing. Um, we were able to overcome that, though. Um, specific to power electronics within the department, uh, we have four full-time faculty, myself, Dr. Leon Tolbert, Dr. Fred Wong, and Dr. Kevin Bai, who just started this fall. And we have 43 graduate students focusing on power electronics, advised by one of the four of us. Um, Larger, if I combine power electronics and power systems within current, we have 150 graduate students focused on these areas, power electronics, power systems, and related areas to the current overall mission. Um, we offer graduate certificate programs, one in wide band gap power electronics through the traineeship, um, but open to all students, and then one in power and energy systems through the center. And our focus in our coursework is on hands-on, design-oriented education in power electronics courses. Uh, heavy emphasis on lab courses. Here is a lab course I teach where we design electric bikes. You get an electric bike on day one. Over the course of the semester, you build up all the power electronics and controls to be able to go outside and ride that electric bike. Um, as far as 
graduate research projects, the application areas that we focus in are shown here. Um, and I'll kind of go through these one by one and just give a quick example of some of the projects we're working on, just to give you a flavor of the research that we do. Um, so starting with utility applications, um, this project was an RPE project where we collaborated with Oak Ridge and SPX to design a series reactor for the transmission network, which was controllable by power electronics. So it's a 115 kV, 1500 amp series reactor for the transmission grid that we controlled, so this is the whole reactor here, and this box here is a 2,000 amp peak buck converter that injects DC current into a winding on that reactor that saturates the core and allows us to control the reactants. This plot shows the reactants varying from 5 ohms down to sub 2 ohms by that injection of DC current, which can be used for things like power control and fault current limiting, being able to control the impedance of that series of reactor. But other applications next, I'm going to talk about medical devices. And I really like to juxtapose these two projects. So next to our 115 kV, 1500 amp series reactor, I'll talk about our 100 nanoamp, 100 millivolt implantable energy harvesting project. We designed RF energy harvesting circuitry that could be powered entirely off of just Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz, and be implanted into humans, or in this case, collaborating with the University of Colorado Medical School mice to do long-term monitoring without having to have replacement batteries by powering this thing entirely off wireless energy. Um, another more recent project, collaborating with Covidian, we designed electrosurgical generators, power electronics for electrosurgery implements, designed a, a converter that could power multiple instruments at different frequencies from a single full bridge inverter, so working on different modulation schemes to be able to produce that and regulate two different frequencies. Um, we work heavily in electric vehicles and aerospace. Um, so a couple projects there, We're currently working with uh, Boeing on funding from NASA to design a one megawatt cryogenic motor drive for the N plus three electric aircraft, so three generations in the future, what will it look like? And one take on that is that there will be superconducting motors and all electric propulsion. And with superconducting motors, there is uh, coolant on board to keep uh, the superconductors down at low temperature. And their take was, well, if we have that coolant, can we design the power electronics to use it? So we're looking at designing a one megawatt converter down at minus 200 degrees C, 70 degrees Kelvin, um, and having to figure out how to characterize, how to design for those low temperatures. Um, then electric vehicles, uh, we have projects working with Oak Ridge National Lab, They're well known for their work in power electronics for electric vehicles. Looking at things like functional integration, can I take what were multiple disparate converters within an electric vehicle and combine them into a single topology? so that I have only the weight, size, and cost associated with one of them. Okay. Then power supplies, um, we've done a few different designs of complete power conversion systems from AC all the way to 1.2, 1.8 volts for data centers. And this just shows two of those complete conversion systems, AC to DC, DC to DC, and then the final point of load converter um, on a design that we um, completed a while ago, and then this one here was sponsored by Intel and the Semiconductor Research Corporation. Um, two different takes, one had a 400 volt DC distribution, one had a 48 volt intermediate bus, but in both cases we designed kind of the end-to-end -end power conversion system and achieved very high efficiency, reducing the number of conversion stages. Work in renewable energy, um, what I'm showing here was originally a project for the Google Little Box Challenge, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, designing a very high density solar inverter. And then we've continued that work um, looking at designing power electronics for solar panels that minimize total lifetime costs. How can we design them to last as long as possible, have low initial costs, but also low, um, maximize the amount of energy you're getting out of the solar panels, minimize um, the time to payback of, of installing a, a photovoltaic system. Um, Smart home and microgrid projects, one of the things um, that's one of the main power electronics applications within Current, our research center, is this hardware testbed, or called Hardware Universal Grid Emulator, which is a platform for emulation of power systems based on real power electronics. So rather than simulating a multi-bus power system, what we do is we build an emulator out of hardware. So we have multiple of these cabinets, which have within them four three-phase motor drives. And we control those motor drives to behave as though they are a wind turbine, a gas power plant, some battery energy storage, or different types of loads. 
And then by circulating power between these different racks, we can have an emulation of a multi-bus three-phase system. We also have um, a four-bus, ring-bus DC distribution that we can emulate with this. Um, that is then all controllable through our visualization and control room, which is 16 flat screen TVs set up to emulate um, what you'd see in a real control room. So it can all be controlled remotely. Um, so we can run power system studies on that overall system. Okay. Then consumer electronics, we have a number of projects related to wireless power transfer for laptops, cell phones, and other mobile electronics, specifically looking at multi-receiver wireless power transfer. So can I design a system where I have a transmitter coil inside my desk, and then anything I throw on that desk immediately starts charging? Whether I have laptop, cell phone, tablet, mouse, keyboard, all those things simultaneously or individually. Okay. We've also worked on traditional wire chargers working together with Texas Instruments, design of monolithically integrated converters for very high current fast charging of batteries and mobile electronics. Are there any you know, health issues that uh, should be concerned? <laughs> this is kind of a, a bit of an ongoing topic for debate. Um, recently, I guess last summer, there were some initial studies looking at 6.78 megahertz specifically and showing that it does have some biointeractive effects. It's a very initial study, just looking at cell cultures, put in a relatively large magnetic field for an extended amount of time, but showing that there is a difference from a control sample. Um, you can design things so that they're well below, you know, what are typically deemed by IEEE safety standards for magnetic fields. Um, but still, even at those levels, there's a question of whether or not this has long-term effects. Um, and then the last piece that I'll talk about are core technologies, which are things that are kind of broadly applicable across many facets, many applications in power electronics, generally part of the converter design process. So some things that we're looking at, we've done a fair amount of work in intelligent gate drives and intelligent power modules, designing gate drivers that are able to switch devices faster with lower EMI, more ruggedness, as well as power module design, looking at the electrical parasitics and thermal behavior of power modules, incorporating uh, mostly wideband gap semiconductors, wideband gap transistors. And as well, we've been looking at applications of 3D printing into power electronics. So this bottom right shows a 3D printed inductor, where we 3D printed a resin material and then electroplated it to make it conductive. Can we leverage that capability to get arbitrary designed uh, conductive materials? Okay, so that's kind of my quick overview of some of the different research topics. More details on a lot of these projects, like I said, are available on the potential website if you're interested, or I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dive in for my to my topic for the day, um, and what I'm going to talk about is kind of from a broad perspective how we go about analyzing power electronics, where that came from, and then how that relates to how we go about designing these systems to achieve particular performance. And then what I'll propose in the end is that we can look back to some historical developments and make better use of discrete time modeling in kind of the design of these systems. Okay? All of those, I'm either PI or co-PI on. Okay. Most of them PIs, some of them I'm, I'm co-PI on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to begin by talking about analysis of power electronics. And I'll start at a pretty high level here. So when we analyze a power electronic circuit, what is unique about that compared to any other circuit analysis? The answer is that power electronics are fundamentally switched systems, right? So if I look at something like a simple buck converter here, look at the waveforms of that, it has kind of discrete sections where when I have my MOSFET on, I get some behavior out of the states of the system, voltage at the output, inductor current. And when I turn the MOSFET off and the diode turns on, I get some different behavior. Okay. So what makes that difficult is, well, these circuits have inherent nonlinearities and inherent complicating factors for their analysis. So what kinds of things? Well, first, the fact that I'm switching is going to introduce a time dependence, which is not necessarily a nonlinearity. It depends on the topology, how that um, propagates through the system. But fundamentally, if my control input is the source of the time dependence, that can lead to nonlinearity in the system. Okay. 
Next, I certainly have large signal nonlinearity in my semiconductor devices. These are fundamentally nonlinear devices. Um, we have small signal models for them in different regions, but they're going to be jumping between different regions, such as forward bias or reverse bias in a diode, active cutoff in triode in a MOSFET. Okay. And then I have parasitics that are not necessarily nonlinear, but they're going to exacerbate those large signal nonlinearities in my switching devices. So when I start putting in these additional passive elements and try to send these large switching transitions through them, they're going to result in kind of complex behaviors, complex switching waveforms. And then finally, some of my passive elements themselves are fundamentally nonlinear, things like the voltage dependent drain to source capacitance of a MOSFET or saturation characteristics of my inductor. Okay. So the question is, in power electronics, how do we go about dealing with all of this complex stuff and figuring out the behavior of one of these switch mode power supplies? And so to answer that, I'm going to look from first a historical perspective. Okay. When were these techniques developed and, and how did really the field of power electronics start? And I'm going to look at the developments from three people, uh, Professor Robert Middlebrook, who was a professor at Caltech starting in 1955, and then a couple of his students, uh, Professor Slobodan Chuk, who was one of Dr. Middlebrook's students and then became a Caltech professor, and then Dennis John Bacard was another of Middlebrook's students and seems to have disappeared after he got his PhD. If anybody can figure out what he did after that, please let me know. I know him through his PhD thesis. Okay. It may not be, but it's hard to Google him without getting a bunch of those hits. Um, okay, so I, before I start, I just want to give a disclaimer that I'm going to talk about these three people, but there are many other people both in power electronics and outside of power electronics and other fields who are developing similar techniques at the same time. The reason I talk about these three is because I'm biased. They're my advisor's advisor's advisor. Okay, just to be honest with you. Okay, so. Professor Middlebrook um, and his PhD from Stanford in 1955. He was um, kind of known at Stanford as the first guy to get a PhD working with transistors. So we're developed around the 1947 out of Bell Labs. And he went on to become a professor. And one of the things he's best known for is design-oriented analysis. Um, and this was his take on how electrical engineering broadly should be taught. And the idea is that Design is the inverse of analysis. So the only analysis worth doing is analysis that you can then work backwards in order to figure out how to design the system to achieve a particular performance. Okay. So he had these two students, Professor Slobodan Chuk and uh, Dr. Picard, who went about trying to model power electronics. And they came up with two different techniques, and they both got their PhDs in 1976, these two competing techniques. So Professor Chuk developed average modeling of power electronics, which says, as I'm switching between different subsystems, I can model the equivalent behavior of that switch system as an average of the two systems, when the switch is in this state, when the switch is in that state. And it becomes this nice linear system. It's modeled in state space, x dot is ax plus bu where A and B are just weighted averages of the two individual systems, switch in one position or the other. Okay. Dr. Picard developed discrete time modeling, where he directly solved the differential equations in each individual state and came up with an overall discrete time system that models the state propagation. Okay. And these two techniques can be represented in this way. So average modeling, Chuk results in this very simple system, which I can back out and give an equivalent circuit model of. Looks something like this. Here's my power converter. All of the basic PWM topologies can be modeled in this same form, and I can analyze it just to some equivalent circuit. Dr. Picard's discrete time modeling resulted in this big equation, which we'll look at where this comes from in a moment. So when I look back and say, OK, Dr. Middlebrook, one of his big things was design-oriented analysis. Which of these techniques is more design-oriented? You say, OK. Average modeling is much better. I can look at this system, the result of my analysis, and I can invert this and say, what do I need things to be? How is this going to behave? I can look at this and gain intuition about the system. And in fact, they talked about this uh, in a paper published in 1981, uh, where Professor Middlebrook said, OK, state space averaging is very convenient. It's inaccurate in some conditions because of a lot of approximations. 
discrete time modeling is very accurate, but it has all these different equations and complex equations that people don't really like. So as it turns out, this um, average modeling kind of became the standard, and it's the way we teach power electronics in most universities. Discrete time modeling is still known in the field, but not heavily thought, not heavily used. Okay. Um, before I move on and talk about how this relates to design, I just want to mention these are kind of two techniques. There are many other circuit analysis techniques, things like state space analysis, sinusoidal analysis, charge vector, that all have various degrees of design-oriented nature and various degrees of accuracy, as well as many more than, than just these. Okay. But so what I want to talk about is, OK, I had one method that was accurate, but maybe not very design-oriented, maybe not a lot of intuition. It's just some complex equations. And one method, which was very simple to use, but had some inaccuracies in it. And now, looking from kind of a modern perspective with the computational capabilities that we have, is the trade-off still the same? Do I still really need a technique that results in an equivalent circuit that is simple to look at? Or can I gain that intuition in some other way? Okay. Today, designing power electronics, we've got a lot of complex circuits with complex behaviors. And we've got very high requirements on accuracy of the model. Okay. And that's going to relate to looking into design of power electronics. So what do I actually need out of my analysis? Okay. And here I'm just going to give kind of one take on what power electronics design looks like. Okay, so if I'm going for a given application, I'm going to start here. So I have some system specification, some kind of design metrics that I want to meet, maybe efficiency and size and cost. And then my specification tells me what input power, what output power, what are the characteristics of my source and load, maybe some other things. And then from that specification, I'm going to begin designing some power converter to achieve that. Okay. And what all is involved in that? Well, I need to select some sort of circuit topology from among many discrete different topologies. That's maybe done based on insight, done based on some comparison between them. Then once I've selected a topology, I need to actually implement the devices in it. So I need to select all my passive devices and all my switching devices. Passive devices, things like magnetics, I may have some continuous design freedom in terms of the size and dimensions of those switching devices. I may be just selecting among discrete components. Yeah. Once I select all those, I need to figure out how to drive my switches. So I'll have some consideration of switching functions. What frequency am I going to switch at? Uh, what sort of gate current am I going to supply? How fast am I going to try to switch them on and off? Okay. And those switching functions are going to be kind of decided and implicit from however I'm modeling the system. That modeling is going to require data. I'm going to need to know how these switches are going to perform. I may be pulling that from a data sheet or manufacturer models, or I may be testing them myself to get that data. Then from all of that, I'm going to put these together. I'm going to model the overall system. I'm going to care about things like steady state performance as well as dynamic performance. Um, and I'll do that through steady state modeling, small signal modeling, and some sort of performance modeling. Say, what is the efficiency, power density, cost, reliability, other metrics. And when I put all that together, then I can finally say, was this a good design or not? Considering many different metrics, um, as a result of these models. And then I'll either feed back and change, or I'll go towards a system implementation, probably doing control along the way. Okay. So when I look at all these individual design decisions throughout, how am I making those, and what's the overall design methodology? Okay. This is very complicated, and minor changes along the way may re lead to radically different designs. Okay. And to give an example of that, I'm going to talk about uh, the Google Little Box Challenge. And I think you guys are largely familiar with this. And I actually looked on the website and saw you've had a couple seminar speakers from the Google Little Box Challenge. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. I think you guys have seen other people talk about it. But we had a team. We were finalists in this Little Box Challenge. As a reminder, this was a challenge to design the smallest possible 2 kVA single phase inverter that looked for applications similar to solar. It wasn't necessarily specified solar. And there were a bunch of specifications that were common to everybody's design. You had to meet all those specifications and make it as small as possible. Okay. So this down here in the bottom left is our entry. We did not win the competition. We're finalists, though. Okay. So this slide just shows some of the different entries into the competition. 
um, some of the different finalists. There were 17 total finalists. Here's just six of them. And we have things like multi-phase inverters, things like multi-level inverters, things like DC side active power filters or series power filters, series DC to DC converters, more traditional designs. So given a common set of specifications and taking a bunch of teams, my own perhaps not included, composed of experts in the field who really know how to do this well. We resulted, the result was very vastly different designs from the same. I, hey, I thought the UIUC design was very interesting. Um, <laughs> so despite having the same starting point, experts in the field produced very vastly different designs, which tells you in the design of power electronics, there are many ways to reach a given set of specifications. There's not a single way to do this. Okay? So after this, I look back on how we actually approach this. Okay? So we started out by doing a big paper design comparison, compared a bunch of different inverter implementations and control schemes in terms of their volume and efficiency, a bunch of different ways to decouple the line frequency in terms of their volume and efficiency, put these all together and decided, okay, which one shows the most promise, which one will we be able to accomplish in the, the time we have available. Okay. And the overall timeline of this looked like this. So it was a one-year competition. We had one year from the start of it to be able to produce something that we could turn over and have tested. About the first seven to eight months were spent trying to figure out what approach we should take, doing paper-based comparison and design of different candidate approaches. For about this time, we had a final design review and decided on really pursuing two different options, one of which eventually became our entry. What I want to say here is that over this one year, the majority of our time was spent on comparing and designing different approaches and figuring out which one showed the most promise, which one did we think we could accomplish, and which one did we think we had some capability to push the design forward. So my question for um, the development that I'm going to talk about coming up with the discrete time modeling is, is there a way to accelerate this process? Can we figure out a way to more rapidly have an unbiased comparison of vastly different design approaches. They come up with a near optimal candidate. And given how different everything was in my little box comparison, I don't know that we can say one approach was optimal over any of the others, but can we come up with quickly something that's going to be close, something that's going to show a lot of promise? And can we have insight into what is limiting the design and where should we really focus our research efforts to improve things? So we can use different analysis techniques like average modeling or circuit modeling. We can use simulation, which takes longer to get up and running, but may allow us to model more behaviors. Eventually, we'll get down here into prototyping, which will give us a very accurate picture of the performance of a given approach, but will require a whole lot of time and uh, potentially cost and, and uh, effort associated with that. So can we develop something that, that does a better job to get us towards our initial design to focus our efforts? Okay, and what I'm going to propose. I don't. I, I qualitatively uh, assess it, right? So things like finite element analysis, I'm going to say, are relatively low on design insight, very accurate. But using that in order to obtain design insight is very difficult, right? And part of that is because of the speed of it. So I can't run 500 different FEA simulations of vastly different designs in a reasonable amount of time such that I can look at them and have in my mind the relative performance of each and how they compare. Okay? Whereas something like uh, you know, a simple paper analysis, a reluctance model, I can look at and say, okay, here's exactly how everything varies based on different geometrical parameters. <laughs> I still maintain that it does. So I think that discrete time modeling can be used for this purpose. It can get us to an unbiased comparison of many topologies and accelerate the speed at which we can assign and uh, decide on a promising approach to a given design. Um, so I'm going to first kind of review discrete time modeling. Like I said, 
comes back from 1976, um, but maybe foreign to, to a lot of you in the audience. So when we're looking at switch systems, really both the average and discrete time modeling looks at breaking a switch system, assuming the switch is more or less ideal, into linear equivalent circuits for each switch position. And here, for a buck converter in CCM, we'd have two linear equivalents. Um, more generally, we could have any number for any number of switches in a, in a converter. Okay. And then the kind of approach to discrete time modeling is saying, if I make that assumption, then within every subinterval, I have a linear equivalent circuit with only if passives. And potentially, if I want to model some nonlinear behaviors, I can even break them up further using piecewise linear models into some n equivalent linear subcircuits. And if I have just a passive linear circuit, I can solve the behavior of that in closed form, no problem. Right. So what's hard about modeling these? So the approach behind discrete time modeling builds on state space modeling um, to solve directly the behavior of the converter. So in a state space model, I'd write equations relating the derivatives of all of the states in my circuit to the voltages or currents applied to them. So for example, for this subcircuit of the buck converter when the switch is in position one, I can write an equation for LDI dt and CDV dt related to the voltages and currents throughout the rest of the converter. I can take that pair of coupled differential equations and write them as a state space equation, x dot is ax plus bu, or I'll call this a a1 and this b b1 for the a and b matrices when the switch is in position one. Okay. When I go to the second subinterval, I'll have a different a and different b but because it's still a linear equivalent circuit, I can still express them in this form. Okay. So I break it apart in these two positions and I have my state space equation in switch position one and in switch position two. And then what I'm gonna do is directly solve that state space equation okay, under some assumptions. So generally for the state space equation, I can solve it and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to multiply both sides by this integrating factor e to the minus at. And then I'm going to note that over here on the left, if I subtract this ax term, what I have is this exponential times x dot plus the exponential times a, which is the derivative of e to the minus at times x. So this looks like a product rule for derivatives. If I can combine that together and the left side is equivalent to this, the derivative of the product of these two terms. Once I note that, then I can just directly integrate both sides to get an answer. Okay. So if I integrate both sides on the left, the integral of this derivative is going to give me this derivative evaluated at time t minus the initial condition. On the right, what I'm going to have is this integral from 0 to t of my right-hand side. And rearranging, I can solve for the states at any given time t as a function of the initial states, x of 0, and the inputs u of tau. Okay. Then I can make a further simplification by making one assumption about the system. And I'm going to assume that over one switching period the inputs are constant or they vary slowly enough such that over one period they can be approximated as constant. Okay. And this is going to be a limiting assumption that reduces the validity of my solution. This is a pretty valid assumption for power electronics, right? If I'm calling this a DC to DC converter, my input changes significantly over one period, oh, it's not DC at the input, right? Even if I have something like an AC to DC converter, probably I'm switching much faster than the fundamental frequency. So over one period, that input can be approximated as constant. Okay. So if I do that, then this U of tau is no longer a function of tau. I no longer have to, it's now a constant term in this integral, and I can directly integrate this term you get something like this, as long as A is invertible. If A is not invertible, in fact, I can still evaluate this. The expression is going to look a little bit different. I'm not going to um, get into that. We'll just assume A is invertible either inherently or if I model enough resistances in the system, I can make A invertible, okay. model parasitic resistances throughout. Okay. So. Before I go on, I just want to mention something about this. If you haven't seen this matrix exponential before, this may look a little bit weird. So the exponential of a matrix is defined by the same Taylor series as the exponential of a scalar. 
So it's this sum from zero to infinity to be exact of a times t to the k over k factorial. Um, and the matrix exponential possesses many properties similar to the scalar exponential, but not all of them. One important one is that the matrix exponential e to the a t, if I had it, is always invertible and always exists for any matrix A. Okay. So long as that the matrix is well formed, then it's always invertible and the inverse is always the matrix exponential of minus A. So that's a nice thing. No matter what my A matrix is describing my system, this E to the A is going to work. As it turns out, this Taylor series is a really bad way to compute the matrix exponential. And that's what's shown in this plot is that if I try to compute it by summing up the terms in this Taylor series expansion for certain types of systems, it's not going to converge until a huge number of terms. So this plot is showing the error between the matrix exponential and the sum over a finite number of terms of this Taylor series expansion, and that may get really large up to 10,000 terms before it eventually begins to converge. Fortunately, today, you don't have to compute it yourself. You can compute it in MATLAB or similar. And I have a note here at the bottom EXPM is the function in MATLAB that calculates the matrix exponential. If you use EXP of a matrix, it'll give you an answer, and that is the element-wise exponential of a matrix. And you will spend weeks during your PhD wondering why your results aren't working before you figure out that you're using the wrong function. And I speak from experience on that. Most important piece of information in the talk, perhaps. Okay. So, So this will always converge. It may not within numerical resolution of however you're computing it. So theoretically, it converges at a high enough number of terms always. You may, if you tried to compute it this way in MATLAB, you may overflow floating point before you get there. Yeah, I'm thinking of the Taylor or the infinite series when you're trying to approximate a, a unit step, which uh, gives you that. Is that related? I don't know. Well, it also came up in a, in a problem I was working on with eigenvalues where we were dividing transmission lines up into infinite segments. Mm -hmm. And doing the uh, RLC of every segment as you add more. So you start with two states, mm -hmm. inductor, one capacitor, and you end, up, you end up with an infinite number. But the eigenvalues don't converge to uh, anything. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, that one really. But this does converge to something. So it should always converge. It's always going to exist and be invertible and be finite. Uh, what, 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 uh, what does that paper say about the just computing the eigenvalues of the matrix and the eigenvectors and just, you know? <laughs> so that's, I believe, one of the 19 ways. In the end, um, some combination of scaling and squaring. Um, and there's been, since this paper, many modifications of that, I believe is what's used in MATLAB. Um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Right, yes, what is the, the, the eigen decomposition of the matrix A and then the exponential is going to be, you know, sandwich of, of the exponentials of the eigenvalues and all that stuff. Right. So if you can... Yeah. So the problem is, so this exists even if A is not invertible, yeah. right? So a case that covers even non-invertible A. So you take the Jordan one. You, you can right. As long as you can. Yeah. Is there any reason why the error shoots up and then goes down? Right. So it has to do with generally, you know, as in any infinite summation, how fast this increases versus how fast this increases. And for large enough terms, this will increase faster, right? But when you start talking about a matrix, what's the norm that you're talking about, how fast it increases? So it really has to do with, you know, and this is a relevant point here, but what are the dynamics of the system? Are they, okay, if you have a system that's slowly varying, then e to the at approximated as linear 
is going to be sufficient. If the dynamics are all much slower than t, then it'll converge pretty well after two terms. If you have dynamics involved in that that are much faster than t, then it's going to require many terms. Right? So but that is. Is this going to describe the dynamics of sort of the time average way of looking at this? So no averaging involved. So this is describing exactly the full dynamics of the circuit, right? So this is x of t. In this case, I have the approximation, but here, this is no, x of t. Mm -hmm. right. So you can describe the average version also in this light, or if, if you wanted to do the switch one, you can also analyze it. So the average version is going to turn out um, makes a couple of approximations. The first of which is that everything is every one of these matrix exponentials can be approximated by the Taylor series, just a first order. So i plus at. If you make that, and then make some assumptions about the um, speed of the dynamics you reduce to the average model. And I actually didn't include that here, but you can show that this discrete time model becomes the average mon model under two additional assumptions or simplifications. Okay, so applying this now, taking this equation we have, which gives you the states at time t from the states at time zero with the A and B matrices describing your system. I can use this to describe now my switch systems that exist in power electronics. So I'm going to have this same equation applied in switch position one and applied in switch position two. And combining them, I'm going to be able to describe the net behavior over an entire period. And so that's going to look like this. So over the first subinterval, I have x dot is a1x plus b1u. And plugging those into my equation, oh, there it is. I can say the states at the end of switch position one are equal to x naught, a1, and b1 plugged in to the equation we just derived. Okay. Then I can apply it again in switch position two using a2 and b2 with my initial condition being the states at this switching time to get the states at the end of the period. And that'll look like this. My initial condition, the states in blue. I'm using a2 and b2 to propagate to the end of the period. And then I'm just going to combine these two equations, plug in x of dts here. And what I'll get is this equation, which looks like a product of matrix exponentials times the states at the beginning of the period, plus some sum of these uh, terms that resulted from that integral that we evaluated times matrix exponentials times the inputs. And this gives me the relationship between the states of the start of my period and the states at the end of the period close form with only one approximation, which is that the inputs are slowly varying. But here, I mean, um, this works uh, well. I mean, you can write equations and push it all through and all that. If you know the, the, the time of the, when the switching is going to happen, but uh, when you throw in the close, I mean, the control and you close the loop, you don't know that beforehand. So how do you address that here? So a couple of things there. So first is. Um, you do need to know the exact time of each switching subinterval, right? So as far as control is concerned, how do you take this large signal formulation, which is still fundamentally nonlinear? It looks like a linear system. Which let me just cover this here. So if I plug that all in and generalize for any number of switching periods, this is what that equation looks like, a product of matrix exponentials times the sum of this, which looks like a discrete time system of this form, which is fundamentally linear. The problem is my control is in these TIs, how long I stay in each switching subinterval, which is kind of absorbed inside of these equivalent phi and psi matrices. So if I'm going to exert control on it, I can find that uh, controlled output transfer function a couple different ways. One is small signal modeling, which I won't talk any further about because that's been covered in the literature, um, where I can do a small perturbation on top of this waveform and then propagate it through to the end of the period to get a small signal model where I have a coefficient on d hat. If I want to, um, so there's two cases where, where this matters, right? One is that it's still fundamentally nonlinear, so my control model may need to be small signal, or I can do things like sliding mode control or something else. Um, if I want to design a linear digital controller, I would go with the small signal model. The other case that's going to come up, I may not have time to get there, but at the end, 
sometimes you don't know these times, specifically because there are non-controlled switching actions, things like a diode shutting off. Then you don't have a specific control action that's dictating the time that that diode is on. Then, even if you have like the switching boundaries, how do you know a priori when the projector is going to hit the, the boundaries? So it depends if you have, well, so first is the focus here I'm going to talk about designing with this, which is going to stick in the large signal domain of steady state analysis rather than control. Okay. okay. That is a problem that we're actually looking at, though. Okay. So if I want to do something like this, less so with the control slant, but more so at the non-controlled switching actions, which is kind of a similar problem. How do you solve this? One of the, um, as far as design is concerned, Interesting things about this is I can compute this so rapidly that I can iterate and find those boundaries just numerically. Okay. Um, we'll talk about more in a moment. Okay, so like I said this can be used to find some small signal model. I'm not going to focus on that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look back at this expression, which is still at the moment a large signal expression, assuming I know these times, and say, how can this tell me the steady state solution of the converter? Okay, well, steady state solution of a converter is defined as states at the end of the period are the same as the states at the beginning of the period. Then it's reached periodic steady state, right? So the next period will be the same as this period was. So if x of ts is equal to x naught, I'll call that just some capital XXS, which is the steady state states at the beginning of a period. Then I can plug that in. x of ts and x of naught are both XSS. And then solve this whole thing for the steady state states at the beginning of the period of the switching converter. Okay. So this thing is now kind of a big nasty equation, but with only the assumption of slowly varying inputs, this is the steady state solution to any switching converter, which can be described as a sequence of linear equivalent circuits, which is, to varying degrees of accuracy, any switching converter we might look at. Mm -hmm. So it has to be in the same mode, that is A1 or A2, which one was operational at 0 and T as they also need to come up. It will be the same. So if it's in periodic steady state, yes. then at the end you would go back to the first system, is that? Yes, so you have to, be, if you were in mode 1, mm -hmm. then at TS you also need to be in mode 1. You cannot be in mode 2 and at the same state. That does not work. It's still then not a periodic state. Right, but it's assuming that your switching is periodic. So if you go over one entire period, you're going to go back to wherever you started you to be in periodic steady state. Right. I mean, you only have That's an, here anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. And I'll look at ones with six more modes. Um, but really focused on I said, steady state analysis. So we can make these kinds of assumptions and say when it's at this operating point in steady state, this is going to be the behavior of it. And this will solve the waveforms throughout the converter. Okay. So it's going to be valid as long as my assumption on u being constant is OK, as long as all of my times are known, which we've been discussing, and as long as I can describe every subinterval as an equivalent linear circuit. So it may require me to go to piecewise linear models and expand the number of modes if needed. Okay, it requires no dedicated analysis other than finding AI and BI of the circuit, which is equivalent to just saying, give me a description of the switching circuit. What is the topology? What is the connections in the circuit? The problem is, as it relates to the discussion I've been motivating with this, is this is decisively not a design-oriented equation, right? It's very complicated. I can't look at this and understand any behaviors of the system just by staring at this equation. Okay, I'm going to hop over this based on time. This is just an example of that we modeled in discrete time and it was very accurate. I have a second example that I'm going to hop to. Okay. Um, so here, I'm going to use this method to analyze a hybrid Dixon switch capacitor converter, which is a switch capacitor topology based on a Dixon that has an inductor at the output, which can be used to reduce a little bit of the losses. Um, and my design here is for a 48 to 5 volt converter from 0 to 100 amps output. It says 13 states and three switching subintervals, three different equivalent switch models. Okay. So when I use this equation to analyze it, 
I'm going to plug everything in. I'm going to write my A and B matrices for these three subintervals. They're both going to be um, have all 13 states. And what it's going to solve eventually is just this point here. Okay. Here I'm just showing one of the states, VC1, voltage on this capacitor. It's going to solve all 13 states, but it's just going to give me the state value at the beginning of the period. Okay. But the, Sure, what we were calling modes earlier. Okay. Um, so I really only get this one point out of it, but I can back out through everything I just showed you and get now the state values at each switching junction when I switch between different modes. And then just applying that solution to the, study, uh, to the state space equation, if I wanted to, I could solve at any given time in each mode. And here's my steady state trajectory for this state. Here's what it looks like over one full period. And now I can use this to analyze the behavior of the converter, doing things like varying the load and looking at the waveforms. I can also, with any appropriate C and D matrices, solve for any non-state voltage or current throughout the converter in order to find things like input power and output power and then eventually assess efficiency. Here I'm looking at, as output current varies from 10 to 100 amps, three of the states and I'm looking at two different types of operation. One is just normal hybrid Dixon operation, and one is split phase control, which comes from this reference here, which was published here at UIUC previously. So this adds in a couple extra modes, as we've been saying, that allow the capacitor voltages to be matched before any switching action that reduces some of the losses associated with shorting capacitors together. Okay. So in these two different modes, regardless of which one I use, I can solve the steady state waveforms of the converter. And then I can go through and do things like very different design parameters. Here I'm showing the efficiency versus output current for varying switching frequencies with a constant MOSFET on resistance, and then at a constant switching frequency for various on resistances. And this whole thing, once I just wrote the A and B matrices, which is defining the circuit, takes about 10 milliseconds in MATLAB on my office PC to computate each individual operating point. So I can go through in a couple of seconds and produce both of these plots and then begin looking at the net behaviors. Okay. So here I'm plotting both hard charging and soft charging in red and blue. And comparing them, you can see blue is largely better, which is this split phase control developed here at UIUC. And um, plotting how the switching frequency on resistance relate to these as expected, higher on resistance is going to result in poorer efficiency. But there is something interesting you might notice on this plot, though, is that for some of these higher resistances, the split phase control actually becomes a little bit worse than the traditional control. And down in this region, traditional modulation actually outperforms the split phase control because the split phase control results in a little bit higher peak currents, which exceed the benefit gain from reducing these charge sharing losses. Okay. And I draw this out not specifically because it's a uh, all that crazy, it makes a lot of sense, but because of that, right? So I can look at these and I can gain insight about circuit operation from rapidly computing and looking at behaviors of it, okay? And this is going to form kind of another way to achieve design-oriented analysis. So just to prove out that these models can be trusted, we built and tested a, in this case, 8 to 1 hybrid diction switch capacitor converter, and this model matches very closely with the measured efficiency. Um, this is a little bit different that it's 8 to 1 instead of 4 to 1, and the model includes the capacitor ESR. But with no other changes, I was able to get this to match the actual measured performance very well. Okay. So going further with this point is, okay, we have a non-design oriented equation now, but can I get that design intuition from, well, instead of the form of the equation, from actually just numerically evaluating that equation? If I can solve steady state operation in a couple of milliseconds, then I can get my design intuition from solving it at lots of different points and looking at the trends and behaviors of this. Okay, so one way that I'm going to show here is here I'm plotting the change in power loss versus the change in a given parameter in units of watts per percent change in that parameter. I'm looking at changing the resistance, switching frequency, inductance, on resistance, C fly looking at how the total power loss of the system depends on all these different parameters of it. And I can get, for different output currents, what is the dependence of the power loss on each of these and how much will a small change in these parameters affect the total power loss. 
So there's a lot here. I'm just going to look at a couple of the uh, conclusions you can draw from this. Okay, switching frequency, I would like to decrease at low currents because of the switching losses of my transistors. As I go up to very high currents, I'd like to increase the switching frequency because of the charge sharing losses of the capacitors. And this is mirrored by my trends in C-fly. Okay. As far as MOSFET selection, let's see is that as I go to higher and higher current, I get a stronger and stronger dependence on R on, whereas I have more or less flat dependence on the stored charge of the MOSFET. So anywhere above about 30 amps, I'd rather have smaller R on than worry about the stored charge. So I'd like to put more devices in parallel. Okay. And then as far as the inductor, I've got almost no dependence on the inductance above about 10 amps. There's a little bit of a blip down here in the screen line but I've got very strong dependence on the resistance of the inductor. So I'd really like to find a lower resistance inductor, even if that forces me to go to smaller L. So I can gain this kind of design intuition rather than by having a equivalent circuit model or a simple equation by actually just looking at the trends of the converter numerically. Okay. Um, and still, to this point, I haven't written a single unique equation. I haven't done any analysis of this converter itself other than just writing those A and B matrices, which in fact, for this, I did with a um, script we wrote that just automatically parses a net list into A and B matrices. Okay. So limiting assumptions here, I don't think I have time to get into the details of this, but are that the inputs are DC or slowly varying. That one we've kind of already talked about. It's not so important. It's going to be valid for most power electronics applications. But I need to have all subinterval times known requires that all of my switching actions be controlled, which I may not have. And then in each subinterval, I have a linear equivalent circuit. Um, Non-controlled switching actions quickly are things like diode turn on or off, which can happen, for example, in the dead time of a buck converter. If I tell it I know the dead time, and I set the operating point to such a condition that the diode would turn on, because I'm modeling a circuit without the diode in it, I can have things like the diode voltage go negative, I would need to iterate the system in order to get a valid solution. So I would need to have some sort of check and iteration or otherwise modify how I solve this thing. And switching loss modeling, we can incorporate it into it. Um, things like double pulse test data are a good way to model switching loss. There are some other approaches to incorporate into this model. Double pulse data testing would be reliant on the availability of such data a lot of universities do. A lot of universities are digitizing data sheets and running their own double pulse tests. As part of this work, what we're proposing to develop is an online data repository where any sort of the design data that you're using in your power electronics, you can upload and as well have access to any of the data that we're using at the University of Tennessee or in any other partners. That's something that we're going to have roll out in the next couple of years. Okay. So overall, my paradigm here is using this discrete time framework together with data, this is it, then using design optimization to design these converters in a way that's uniform, quick, accurate, and can be adaptable to various levels of design data. Okay. So thank you all. I appreciate your attention. And we'll all run out of here real quick.